Let's look at this A-level question, which is all about muscles. Uh, we're being asked to describe specifically how calcium ions cause the myofibrils, which remember are the functional units of the muscle, uh, to start contracting. So let's have a go. First marking point, specifically what the calcium ions do is they bind to troponin. So the calcium ions bind to troponin. Now remember, troponin is one of the proteins associated with the actin. The actin is the thin protein filament in the myofibril. And if you remember, actin has tropomyosin wrapped around it with the globular troponin attached to the tropomyosin, okay? Tricky. <laughs> so the calcium ions are going to bind to the troponin. What that will cause is the tropomyosin will move aside. Let me just explain that. The calcium ions bind to the troponin, which causes the troponin to change shape, which will pull on the tropomyosin and move the tropomyosin aside or to, to one side. In moving the tropomyosin, what you're then going to do is expose the binding sites on the actin. So binding sites on actin are exposed. Or you could say that the myosin heads can now bind to the actin. Okay, so we've got a lot of proteins going on in this question. We've got the actin filaments, which are the thin filaments, but remember they are associated with the tropomyosin, which wraps around, and the tropo <laughs> tropomyosin, which wraps around, and the troponin, which is attached to the tropomyosin. We've also now mentioned myosin, which is a thick protein filament in the myofibril. And it's the protein heads, the myosin heads, that will bind to the actin, and that's what causes the muscle to contract. Okay, let's look at this four mark question uh, on a really important and fundamental topic in biology. We are linking the DNA with the protein. Um, yeah, it comes up a lot, this idea. So we've got this idea that a single base substitution mutation can lead to the production of a non-functioning enzyme. Let's describe why. So, first idea, if you have a single base substitution mutation, remember that means that one of the bases is being substituted or switched for a nucleotide with a different base. Uh, so, potentially, that could code for a different amino acid, okay? So I'm going to start with that. Different amino acid is coded for. What are we going to say next? Well, if we've got a different amino acid, we have now altered the order or sequence of amino acids. Equally, you could say that you've changed the primary structure because the primary structure of a protein is just the sequence of amino acids. So if we've got a different amino acid coded for by that triplet, you've then altered the primary structure or the sequence of amino acids, which means the hydrogen bonds, the ionic bonds, or the disulfide bonds will form in different places, okay? Now, you don't have to name all three of those bonds, but you do have to name at least one of them. Um, and a lot of students make the mistake of just saying bonds or maybe not even mentioning them at all. So make sure you name one of the bonds that's involved in the formation of the tertiary structure. And basically, because you've got a different order of amino acids, and therefore the R groups are in a different order, these important bonds are not gonna form in the same way. They're gonna form in different positions, different places. So ultimately, 
the tertiary structure of the enzyme, remember this question is specifically about an enzyme, the tertiary structure of the enzyme will be different. Now we've probably got four marks already, but let's just finish it off because it is about an enzyme so we can extend our answer a little bit further. Um, with it being an enzyme, if the tertiary structure is now different, then the active site is a different shape. It's important to say it will no longer be complementary to the substrate. Or even better, if you can say enzyme substrate complexes no longer form. Okay. Now, what I say to all my students is if ever you get an enzyme question, you check your answer and you ask yourself, have I used the word active site? Have I used the phrase tertiary structure? Have I said enzyme substrate complexes? Because if you haven't, you're probably not going to get all of the marks. So use that as a little checklist. Um, yeah, and that's it. This idea does come up an awful lot. So make sure you understand the link between DNA and protein, and obviously what the effect could be if there's a change in the base sequence of the DNA. So you could get a three mark question on your A-level biology exam asking you to give three differences between the two types of cell division, meiosis and mitosis. So let's go through and think of what those three differences could be. We'll start with the most obvious and the easiest answer, which meiosis involves two divisions, whereas mitosis only involves one division. Now, the same marking point, so it's not going to get you a separate mark, but the same marking point, you may be able to say that meiosis makes four daughter cells whereas mitosis makes two daughter cells. But it is probably going to be the same marking point because it's the fact that you have two divisions that makes four daughter cells and the fact that you only have one division that makes two daughter cells. So I'm going to put those together in the same box. Uh, something else we can say that's kind of obvious is meiosis produces genetically different cells, whereas mitosis obviously produces genetically identical cells. Okay, uh, remember meiosis is all about introducing variation, whereas mitosis produces cells that are clones or genetically identical. Right, a little bit harder then, we do need to think of a third. So something else that you can say with meiosis, um, homologous pairs of chromosomes associate and are separated. Because if you think about meiosis 1, which is the first division in meiosis, during that process, the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up on the equator in pairs and um, they associate, they form bivalents, they come together in pairs, and then the homologous pairs are separated. That does not happen in mitosis. The homologous pairs do not associate and are not separated. Um, so homologous pairs do not associate or are not separated. We've definitely got three marks, but one other thing you could say with meiosis, crossing over occurs with mitosis. Obviously, there's no crossing over because you don't get those bivalents. So you don't get the opportunity for bits of chromatid to kind of switch over and switch position. You don't get those chiasma forming, which are those cross points on the chromatids. 
let's look at this quick two mark question, uh, which is asking us to describe specifically the role of ATP in translation. Now we've done a longer video on translation before, but this question is not asking us for the full story, it's just asking us to focus on the specific use of ATP. So you're going to get one marking point just for telling the examiner that ATP releases energy. Seems really simple, doesn't it? But remember, that's what ATP is. We hydrolyze that bond between the second and third phosphate group and it releases a small amount of energy. That's why we need ATP. So you will get one mark just for remembering that simple fact. But let's say exactly what the energy is needed for in translation. Well, that energy is needed to um, join amino acids using peptide bonds, okay? Because you're joining one amino acid to the next and it's an example of a condensation reaction. It creates that peptide bond. But any time you are synthesizing a molecule, whether it's protein or glycogen or cellulose or whatever, any kind of synthesis does require energy because you're making bonds. So it will require energy from ATP. Something else that you can say that you may not know, the other thing that does require ATP is actually to join the amino acid onto the tRNA. Now remember the tRNA, that stands for transfer RNA, that carries a specific amino acid to the ribosome. But the actual process of attaching that specific amino acid to the tRNA at the amino acid binding site, that requires energy from ATP in itself. And then the transfer RNA can bring in the amino acid and we also need that energy to join the amino acids together to create the polypeptide chain. Okay, so how is the production of mRNA or messenger RNA different in a eukaryotic cell compared to a prokaryotic cell? Now, obviously the difference with um, DNA in a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell is that eukaryotic DNA contains introns, which are the non-coding regions, and prokaryotic DNA doesn't contain introns. Now that's not going to get us a mark because it's not asking us about the DNA, it's asking us about the production of mRNA, but it's obviously affected by the fact that eukaryotic DNA has introns and prokaryotic DNA doesn't. So with eukaryotic mRNA, when that's produced, initially we call it pre-mRNA or primary mRNA. So I'm going to start with that. In eukaryotic cells, pre-mRNA or primary mRNA is produced. Now that's what we call it initially and um, before before the introns get removed. So we have our pre-mRNA, which contains introns, um, because obviously they were present in the DNA. And then those introns are gonna get removed. So let's talk about that next. Um, introns need to be removed. Obviously with prokaryotic DNA, because there was no introns in the DNA, the mRNA will not contain any introns. So in prokaryotic mRNA, we don't call it pre-mRNA and the introns will not need to be removed. Um, another mark that you could get is that the pre-mRNA needs to be spliced or splicing occurs because splicing is the name we give to the process of removing those introns, okay? So piecing it all together with our eukaryotic cells, we're gonna make pre-mRNA, which is then gonna be spliced to remove the introns, and the end result, we will call it mature messenger RNA. Obviously, that doesn't happen in a prokaryotic cell. 
Let's look at this four mark question from A-Level Biology. Um, it's asking you to explain how the use of antibiotics has led to the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Basically, a natural selection question, but using the example of resistant bacteria. Okay, so let's start with marking point one. Uh, we need to point out what the selection pressure is. Now, clearly, we've got it in the question. The antibiotics or the use of antibiotics as a treatment um, is the selection pressure. Okay, so we're going to get one mark for pointing that out. We call it a selection pressure because it's putting pressure on the population of bacteria. So that's marking point one. Now, obviously, the bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic in the environment are going to be at an advantage. They're going to be able to survive. So that's how we're going to get marking point two. Resistant bacteria survive. Okay. And marking point three, they will go on to reproduce. Okay. Passing on the allele for resistance. Now, something I just want to highlight here at this point, it's really important that you don't start to say strange things like, oh, because of the antibiotic, the bacteria will mutate, um, or the antibiotic causes the bacteria to mutate. Remember, mutations happen randomly. They are spontaneous. The presence of the antibiotic does not cause the mutation, but the presence of the antibiotic just gives the bacteria that are resistant an advantage, okay? Because it's basically going to kill all of the non-resistant bacteria, allowing the resistant bacteria to survive, and not just survive, but survive with far less competition, okay? But the mutation that causes the resistance is random. It's not as a result of the antibiotic. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so the resistant bacteria survive, or you can say the non-resistant bacteria die, which is just the converse. Those bacteria will go on to reproduce, passing on the allele for resistance. And finally, the frequency of the resistance allele will increase in the population. Now, I have been specific there. I've not just said the frequency of the allele. I've made it clear to the examiner it's the frequency of the allele that gave resistance or the frequency of the advantageous allele. It's that allele that will increase in frequency because that's the one that enabled them to survive and reproduce. That's the one they're passing on and it's going to increase in that population of bacteria. Okay, we're going to look at some questions about insects because we've not actually done much on insects and their respiratory systems yet. So, first of all, one mark question. Can we simply name the structure through which gases will enter and leave an insect? Hopefully you know that those structures are called spiracles. And they're basically like little pores on the abdominum, abdominum, ab abdomen, couldn't remember the word then, abdomen of the insect. So they're like little pores along the bottom surface. And um, I always think they're a little bit like stomata on a leaf, but then the problem is you don't want to mix those two things up, okay? Spiracles are what we get on the insect. Now, once the air goes in through those spiracles, it's going to enter a network of tubes. And we're being asked here to name the tubes that carry the gases directly to the cells of the insect, so to the body cells. So those tubes would be the tracheoles, and um, they'd probably accept trache as well. Um, but the way it works basically is that the air goes in through the spiracles, and then the larger tubes are called the trache, and then the trache branch into finer tubes, which are called the tracheoles, and they connect all the way with the body cells. Uh, a little bit more of an extended question here. Explain the movement of oxygen 
into body cells when an insect is at rest, okay? So if the insect's at rest, we're not thinking about movement of wings or abdominal pumping. We're just talking about the basic diffusion um, of oxygen into the body cells. So the insect is at rest. The way that's going to work is the body cells are using oxygen for aerobic respiration. Now, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to create the diffusion gradient because if they're using up oxygen for aerobic respiration, there's going to be a low concentration of oxygen in the body cells. So you're basically creating a diffusion gradient or a concentration gradient for oxygen. Okay, so diffusion gradient for oxygen is created. And what that means is then oxygen is going to diffuse, so just simply diffuse down the diffusion gradient. Ooh, if I can fit it in. So it gives us an opportunity to just revise diffusion a little bit as well. Obviously, simple diffusion is just the net movement uh, from a high concentration to a low concentration or down the diffusion gradient. So because we've got a low concentration of oxygen in the body cells, we've created or established that concentration gradient. So oxygen is automatically going to move into the body cell down the concentration gradient from a higher to a lower concentration by diffusion. If you enjoy content like this, make sure to hit the subscribe button and click the link in the description below to join my biology course.